All right. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, so this talk is exploring art, narrative, and mental health in anamorphine. Uh, so we are Artifact 5. Um, I'm Samantha Cook, uh, producer, and this is Rami. Yeah, my name is Rami Bakstani, I'm a programmer. Um, we co-founded Artifact 5 along with a third uh, person last year, so uh, we're still very new and we're based in Montreal and uh, we're you know, working on our first game, Anamorphine. Uh, and we have uh, seven people right now. And uh, if any of you are into like funding, we're government funded by the Canada Media Fund. So uh, in, in a uh, incubator and accelerator called Execution Labs. So if you're into that kind of Canadian funding model, we're also happy to talk about that afterwards. <laughs> Uh, so today we want to talk about uh, some trends in games. Oh no, that's you. Sorry, I got distracted. Wait, no, it's fine. That's me. All right, cool. Right, we want to talk about some trends in games and our take on the genre of the emotional narrative. Uh, we're making a game that centers on issues of mental health, um, as this presents excellent opportunities to represent issues people deal with on a daily basis, but also stretch the idea of what games can accomplish. Um, all that said, we're game developers, not mental health professionals. Uh, we consult with a psychologist for our game to make sure we're not messing it up. Uh, but ultimately, the game is based on our perspectives about these issues. So there's been a recent surge in games that have approached narrative or mental health in innovative ways in the last two years. Uh, the fact that people are becoming more and more interested in empathy games or walking simulators or emotional games uh, really shows that there's a maturity and taste in uh, the gaming audience for new and more complicated uh, fare. In the past four years, indie games with a more contemplative pace and emotional, and emotional depth uh, have found their audience and their market. Uh, one of the first developers uh, to do this is the Chinese Room, uh, at least to do it very successfully, is the Chinese Room with uh, their title Dear Esther, uh, which seems to have inspired a slew of other developers to make related games that were well received. Uh, most recently, they came out with Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, and uh, the recent release of Firewatch is actually a really great example. Mm. So at Artifact 5, we wanted to make an emotional narrative uh, covering themes that we didn't see in video games at the time. Uh, we wanted to make a game that was introspective and surreal. Mental health issues like depression and trauma are both manifested physically and mentally as body and mind conspire to change the way you view the world. We felt that the way depression and, uh, depression and trauma can manifest would fit in the way we wanted to explore our game mechanics. So in our game, when your world feels like it's falling apart, we literally make it fall apart. Uh, so games with irrational environments where space folds in on itself and the impossible can occur uh, have also seen a surge in popularity in recent years. Uh, the irreverence of Antichamber and the Stanley Parable, uh, when it comes to traditional mechanics, inspired us to create something that bent space and time. As there are exciting game design possibilities, uh, that can be found when you let go of traditional Euclidean space. However, we wanted to take these games a step further, mechanically and thematically. Great. Uh, so we're going to show you uh, just our brief sort of teaser. It's just pretty quick, so you can get kind of a taste for what that game looks like. So this is Anamorphine, the teaser. Um, so, uh, this is our studio's first title, and it is currently in production. So, Anamorphine is what we've affectionately called a surreal first-person exploration game. Um, in it, we wanted to dive into what we could accomplish with environmental storytelling, i.e. exploring narrative through environments and mechanics. Um, so, to dive deeper... Oh, sorry. <laughs> to dive you deeper into the trend of using non-Euclidean space to tell stories, uh, we decided to focus on the like the walking part of Walking Simulator, um, stripping away the other trappings of both emotional narrative games and games with weird mechanics. So Anamorphina has no action button. Um, the only mechanics are moving, 
sight and sound. Uh, in addition to this, there's no text and no voiceover, no cutscenes in Anamorphine, so the player has to rely purely on visuals and audio to navigate the game experience. Um, so in Anamorphine, you embody a man called Tyler as he goes through an introspective journey through his memories of his relationship with his wife, Elena. When the player begins the game, it's clear something traumatic has happened to Tyler, but it's unclear what it is. Uh, the player delves into Tyler's memories and begins to discover the events that led to that point. Uh, the memories of their relationship are rosy at first, um, although, and though Elena's underlying depression is apparent at some points, it's managed by her passion for music and active life. But as the narrative progresses, Elena is in an accident, causing her depression to flare up, and Tyler, the player character, to feel intense guilt um, as he feels responsible for what happened, rightly or not. Um, so their apartment is a, a main anchor point in the game. Uh, given the surrealism of Anamorphine, it was important for us to have an environment that grounded the characters and the players in reality. Uh, so this environment conveys the arc of the relationship uh, between the characters and makes it clear how it, the relationship changes over time. And so while this, this space itself is finite, um, we use it in a non-Euclidean way, uh, changing how you walk through it to tell different parts of the story. So you might enter through the main door in one round and go around, see what's there, but then find an exit through a closet and reemerge in the bathroom in a different sort of time. And you know, right here you have like a moving in scene, but you might see different things uh, as you go each time. So that's the sort of more concrete way that we change the environment around you to reflect what's going on sort of in your memories and, and in your head. Uh, another way is a little bit more uh, abstract. So in this scene, for example, you're listening to Elena play the cello for the first time and you start to daydream. So you have environmental shifts that reflect uh, mental states. Um, right. So Tyler's trauma is the lens through which the player experiences the game, which results in an environment full of objects that trigger both positive and negative reactions and memories. So, you know, having this memory listening to the cello is a pretty positive memory, um, but not all of them are. So Elena's depression is the other half of the story, and how you as the player explore Tyler's relationship with Elena and how he was or wasn't able to support her uh, defines how the game ends for you. Uh, so Anamorphine takes place primarily in memories, as discussed. Uh, so the gameplay is based on finding the key memory in each scene and uh, preserving it in your memory palace, uh, sometimes represented, or always represented in our, in our game as a temple. As you collect memories, each scene is preserved here and maps the course of your relationship. Um, but it also shows you where Tyler is blocking out certain memories that he doesn't want to face. Uh, so this is a little bit more gameplay. Uh, we also want to talk about Sound, this is a good clip for that. So uh, we have an in-house sound designer and composer. Uh, she comes from a film background. And since we are relying on sound, but not on text, not on voiceover, this is a really key part of the mechanics. Uh, so you have this underlying cello, but you also have, um, now for example, you should hear the hum. Maybe a little faint, but it's there. So there's motifs that you'll find throughout the game, depending on you know, if you're finding the right things, you know, what's happening around you, um, the kind of underline certain types of emotions or certain types of experiences that you're having. Uh, there you go. So preserving memories, like you just saw, you came through this uh, sort of scene and then you're em you've entered the, uh, the temple here. Uh, so uh, that scene's important to us. Uh, Elena is a cellist, so her career in music and the act of playing is what keeps her depression at bay. Um, so in that scene, you know, the player explores a space that Tyler was daydreaming up as he listened to her play. Uh, the flowers that you saw represented an aspect of, of Elena's depression. So in that scene, how the flowers reacted to the player actions uh, symbolizes different reactions to a person with depression. So for example, um, by acknowledging Elena's depression without either walking all over or ignoring it, uh, you know, the player allowed that flower to sort of bloom entirely. So you couldn't get too close, but you couldn't ignore it either in order to, to get through the scene. Um, so when you awaken from that daydream, you preserve the memory and put it alongside some of the other ones you've gathered. So that's kind of the, the arc of gameplay. Uh, but there's a bit more to it. So when Tyler finds himself facing a particularly triggering memory, uh, instead of preserving it, he blocks part of it out and escapes it, uh, typically through alcohol. So you'll have ways in the game that you can sort of literally, uh, if, if you walk up to a bottle, for example, and you fill your screen with it, you can then sort of walk through it into another environment, which is this uh, desert sort of mesa environment. 
Um, so you feel a sense of freedom at first as you race through it. It's this very sort of open space. It's very different from the confining sort of four walls of your sort of everyday existence. But that escape and freedom doesn't last for long. And Tyler's guilt about Elena's accident sort of comes roaring back. And the mechanics of that, a feeling of freedom that's then turned into gameplay where you can never actually reach your objective, uh, reflects the guilt he's experiencing. Um, so Elena's depression itself is the main narrative thread in the story. So while you have his trauma as a lens throughout the whole thing, what you're really sort of seeing like a lot of you know what happened with her and it's kind of her emotional uh, journey. Uh, so as the player, you don't have power to change what Elena does or how she processes and deals with her depression. You can't change the past as you walk through it. Um, you know, she has agency in that sense. Like you cannot sort of go in and just like save her from herself. That's not that's not how it works. That's not how memory works. Um, so what the player can do is observe how Tyler deals with her depression and note the differences between his perceived reality, uh, twisted by guilt and trauma, and what may have actually happened between them. So as Tyler feels worse, his guilt can manifest in physical forms, embodying his mental demons. Uh, but they're not bad or evil, and this isn't a horror game that we're trying to make. Uh, you're there to drive home the feeling of having done something wrong that you just can't escape, uh, despite whether or not it actually is wrong or not. Um, so in this case, we have this coffee machine that would have transformed into one of these demons. Uh, we have another example here of like what would become a stove or what would be a stove. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the bulk of it. Um, so we're planning on releasing Anamorphine in early 2017. It'll be on PC. It'll also be in virtual reality. Um, usually people come and say, like, are you thinking about VR? We're like, oh yeah. I mean, clearly, this is an immersive experience that's purely sort of visual and sound-based and doesn't need a lot of controls. It's really ideal for VR. Um, and um, Xbox One and potentially PS4 as well. So uh, if you want to follow our progress, we have a newsletter you can sign up for and a blog on our website, artifact5.com. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. So that is it. We are very happy to take questions um, of all sorts of what we're up to. Yeah. Or we're also, it's going to be the break after. We're going to plop down in the cafe. If you want to check out the demo in full, you can come play. So thank you. Thank you.